All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to give folks just a few seconds to get to uh, join in, but uh, I want to thank you all very much for joining on a Friday afternoon. If you're watching this afterwards, um, thank you very much. Uh, this is a uh, a warm Friday here in Maine, um, unusually so for February, as we seem to have had uh, plenty of warm weather, unusually warm weather, or for course. So, um, all right, well, we'll get we'll get jump right into it. Uh, so just as a quick refresher, for those that are new to Blue Shift and still getting used to who we are and wondering what we're doing, well, fundamentally, we are a rocket launch service provider. So we send things, and not people, up to space. And uh, we were the very first company in the world to have launched a rocket commercially using a non-toxic carbon neutral biofuel back in 2021. And we're working right hard right now to develop our full-sized, what we call Marvel engine, uh, that will be used not only on the next rocket that we launch, in our, but our future rockets, uh, to both send things up to space and back down, as well as put them into orbit. Uh, small satellites is our ultimate goal in the next couple of years, tiny class of nanosatellites, which provide things like Earth communications, Earth imaging, uh, and things like monitoring climate change across our planet. So, but today's a very, very special, um, a uh, very special webinar for us because we're finally being able to, we're finally, this is finally an opportunity for us to uh, integrate uh, uh, the students who've been along with the, uh, along with us in this journey of um, developing our engine technology and ultimately our suborbital launch vehicle to space. But before we get to that, um, I just want to kind of review with folks that we are wrapping up uh, what was at one point an unexpected um, path for us for funding, equity crowdfunding. So for those who don't, don't know, we have been fundraising on WeFunder off and on, wefunder.com for the last uh, year and a half, two years. And uh, this all came about because we, uh, when we launched Stardust, we had something like 400 people reach out to us over the course of three days asking, how can we invest in BlueShift? And uh, we decided that um, we, we would give, we really democratize the access and the ability for folks to invest in our company. And uh, in the, over a course of a couple of weeks, we opened up an equity crowdfunding campaign on, on wefunder.com. So this is it. Um, this will probably be our last equity crowdfunding campaign. And we start moving into traditional uh, rounds of funding. Uh, so today, I guess, is um, the 11th, 11 days away. So we'll be shortly having a 10 day countdown. Uh, starting tomorrow for the end of our final campaign. This is really the last opportunity for you uh, and uh, folks of all types to consider uh, to invest in Blue Shift and in our vision for doing a doing space launch in a more Earth-friendly, non-toxic fashion and a more carbon-neutral fashion. Okay, so another another uh, exciting news: we've been part of. Uh, Mass Challenge, the Decarbonization Accelerator. Uh, this has been a, an intense uh, accelerator that we've been working on, especially Lindsay and I have been working on, but also David, David Hayricki and our CTO. And during this, uh, not only sort of developing our strategy map going forward, but we've been had an opportunity to, to talk to uh, several new mentors for our company, including uh, six mentors uh, from Google, IBM, and Barclays and, and other locations. And other companies, um, and we are going to be doing a, a demo presentation. Uh, there's a demo day in New York City at the beginning of next month. Um, also, we had a really fun uh, podcast. Um, it was Angel Invest podcast, uh, Angel Invest Boston podcast, uh, hosted by Sal Dar, and also one of our uh, current investors that I've met in person now a couple times, uh, Ben Litauer, uh, who. Um, both he and Sal were sort of co co interviewing uh, Lindsay and me. Really fun to listen to. I think uh, Lindsay's going to post it here in the chat. There it is, and I'm sure on the YouTube uh, description we'll also post uh, a link to this um, really honest, sincere, transparent uh, uh, interview with uh, Sal and Ben. So check it out. Um, also, I had promised during during our last webinar, I had promised. Uh, that I would share a bit about our updated strategy map, I'm sorry, our timeline. So I'm going to share my screen here in just a moment. And um, 
Okay, there we go. So as you can see here, one of one of the big updates, and this is the part that I said in the last webinar, won't be of much surprise to anyone, but one of our tweaks and changes to our strategy is doing something that nobody else is doing. And the unsurprising part is what we're going to be doing. So we've decided that we are going to wholeheartedly focus and double down on our efforts. This is very appropriate for today's webinar. Our efforts and in, in market focus on uh, launching student, and that's like K through really 16, but K through 12, especially uh, experiments to space and our partnership with Max IQ Space. This is really a green field market for us. So nobody's really doing this today. Uh, and I think this is very exciting. This is one of those um, peripheral markets for space launch that I think all of our competition is, is at, at best at a tertiary level looking at, and we're gonna focus on it explicitly. Uh, and I think it's an incredible opportunity because if, if in, just within the United States alone, um, there's something like 16,000 school districts and if every school district invests the same amount of money that they put into uh, uh, football uniforms and gear, they could do a space launch with Max IQ and uh, Blue Shift Aerospace all the way to space, sort of like a robotics team. So a very small investment for schools, and that's really because of Max IQ's technology in combination with our launch, makes it extremely accessible for these students to really participate in real science, and then we're going to hear about this in just a minute, real science going all the way to space. We're very excited about this. I, I have two kids of my own, but I, I'm very excited about it because there's really no better way to invigorate and to really you know, spark that curiosity in kids about choosing a STEM career than actually doing real science around rockets, rocket engines, and ultimately space launch. So we're very excited about this because um, it's something we can do literally, and we are today. Uh, it's a service we can charge for, uh, not only on the launch side, but even on the engine test side of things, as we'll hear about. And then we're going to go move into our, what was previously our uh, first market, which is the civil and academic suborbital research market. In fact, uh, at the end of this month, in the beginning of next month, we are a gold sponsor uh, at the um, suborbital researchers conference in uh, Broomfield, Colorado. Um, so you'll, if you're planning to go, uh, please come by to our booth. Uh, Lindsay, uh, David Hayrick, and our CTO, uh, Ben Farmer, and I will all be there uh, presenting and, and uh, talking to folks about our launch services. So uh, we're very excited about that, that as well. But the plans are we won't be launching uh, officially for professional researchers until 2024 and beyond. And then the plans are to, in 2026, uh, add on from add on our uh, the service of launching uh, nano satellites into orbit with a specific focus on launching into sun synchronous polar orbit. So taking advantage of the fact that we have a very low cost, privately owned and uh, launch facility off the coast of Maine, which we've worked very hard to secure the location for, and uh, access to launching these tiny satellites into the number one orbit desired for these satellites is sun synchronous polar orbit. Okay. All right. So that's the promised timeline. And I'm happy to go over more details. And by the way, feel free to pop in questions, not only to me, but you'll see here the students and the teachers here shortly. Um, okay. And this is the big reason we're here for today. We, we are, uh, we're going to be talking with students and the students are going to be sharing what they learned and their experience in the cold flow test um, back in November. And we're hoping in a future, web future webinar, we're going to talk a bit about the hot fire test they did. Um, they were able to participate in December. So, okay, I've talked too much already. So I'm going to hand it over to Cody Harris, who is the uh, program manager at Max IQ Space. And he's going to help us uh, really tee up the program and what the students are uh, going to be going over. So um, I'm going to pass it over to you, Cody, so you can pass it over to our special guest. Thank you. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Sasha. Hello, everybody. My name is Cody Harris. Uh, as Sasha said, I'm the program manager of Max IQ Space. Uh, for those of us, uh, for those of you who haven't heard of us, uh, we're a space-based STEM education program with a focus on the development and application of digital electronics. And we do this by creating opportunities for students to engage in real-world experimentation. 
our flagship program is our suborbital launch, which is, of course, through Blue Shift Aerospace. Uh, what we're here to talk about today, though, is the engine test. So for us, the engine test is one step along the way for our students as they move towards that suborbital launch, as they get familiar with the ecosystem that MaxIQ provides, and as they begin to add some of their own custom integrations to that ecosystem. Uh, with us today, though, we have one of our uh, top teams, who's led by actually a uh, MaxIQ uh, employee. He's the, um, the, excuse me, the educational content curator for MaxIQ space. His name is Daniel Lee. He was coming up now. Um, and so hopefully Daniel can introduce some of the students, introduce some of the work they did, and uh, we'll go from there. So without further ado, Mr. Daniel Lee. I appreciate it. Uh, hope everyone's doing well. My name is Daniel Lee. Um, I'm currently an educator at Montgomery High School, actually, in Skillman, New Jersey. So really a lot of the things that we do um, through Max IQ is you know, being able to connect the country as a whole. And we have this really amazing opportunity specifically with Blue Shift. So, um, Really not so much about me, but I'm pretty much here just to kind of give some background to the very special three guests, um, hopefully that we'll be able to hear from. Um, I'm specifically a physics educator um, and more broadly a science educator here at the high school. And we run a after school club um, specifically for aerospace engineering. Uh, recently, we became an aerospace engineering club with the integration of a rocketry program as well. Um, so now we do everything on our side as a school going from building the satellites that we put up into space, as well as now potentially looking at how we actually get there. Um, so really exciting. We have three teams uh, who are applying for TARC this year. So, you know, cross our fingers that we get at least two of them out to nationals as well. So it should be an exciting time. Uh, the big thing specifically for today is to kind of talk through that cold flow test. Um, one of the big things here is along the student's process of being able to build payloads is being able to actually analyze the data that those payloads are able to collect. Um, and I think that's kind of a big part that's really missing um, through the entire STEM kind of, you know, social engagement portion where, you know, a lot of times we tell students, oh, you should build this, build that, but then there's no follow-up to that. So I think really the opportunities that we're being afforded here and really the opportunities that we have through Max IQ in conjunction with Blue Shift um, has really opened up that sphere and hopefully we'll be able to kind of hear some of the impact that that's had on the students directly. Uh, the other big thing is with the payloads for this cold flow test, we had two in particular. We had a vibrational payload that actually mounted directly to the engine. And then we also had an environmental payload. So the conjunction of those two things, really broadly speaking, um, it was all about giving us a holistic idea of not just what's happening at the engine, but also what's happening in the environment around us too. Um, and, you know, not looking at it in terms of a singular data point collecting over time, but having multiple payloads, being able to collect the same thing at different locations, at different intervals, right? Really able to give us a bigger and more full picture and hopefully being able to analyze it in a couple of different ways, we'll be able to see some things come together there as a whole. Um, and I think for me as a teacher, really uh, speaking more so as the Montgomery High School club advisor, rather than as the uh, education content creator for Max IQ, uh, I think it really for those of, those of you guys who um, are on the call right now and are sponsors, um, the opportunities that you're affording really, really my students, I think is incredibly invaluable. And I, and I do want to take a moment as just a teacher to say thank you um, to all the people involved here and all those opportunities that we have available to us. Um, it matters a lot, not just, you know, to the students, but also to you all as broader community members here for Blue Shift that really we are actively going through the process of raising up those next generation engineers, right? That, you know, they're not waiting until they get to college to start doing these things. But like Sasha had mentioned, right? You have kindergartners and you have first graders and second graders who are, you know, building actual satellite payloads, right? And that they can actually be able to state, you know, this is something that I put together and this is something that went then onto an engine, right? And then went into high altitude and then went into suborbital. And, you know, being able to kind of see that lineage of the process for students, I think is just something that is unparalleled. And like Saucer said, it's something that no other company is doing. So really, you know, the fact that the crowdfunding and all of that is going on, huge, huge shout out to all of you um, who are joining us today um, from me as an educator. So 
without further ado, you know, I've kind of taken up my talking portion here. Um, I really want to turn it over to um, the three students on our side here at Montgomery High School who were kind of integral, not just in the participation of the engine test, but also the development of it. So Sahani, as soon as you're ready, go ahead. All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, as Mr. Lee introduced me, um, my name is Suhani. I am a senior at Montgomery High School and I am president of the Aerospace Club here. And we were, had such an amazing opportunity because of a blue shift and max IQ. It was so accessible and it's really allowed us to immerse ourselves in the aerospace industry. That's just, it's just been fantastic. And it's allowed us to really have a real world experience by providing us not only the opportunity to launch like a payload, but also go through a real world data collection process via the cold flow test. So during the cold flow test, we alongside other schools, which were amazing, by the way, we had the chance to really engage with students from other parts of the US and really talk to them and talk to people who are also very invested in the aerospace field. So that was also amazing, but more about the cold flow test. So we had the opportunity to collect vibration and environmental related data using max IQ sensors. And that experience really added dimension to our high school, like learning experience in general by allowing us to really physically go there and like be a real scientist basically as we've got the chance to really move out of the classroom and the classroom is great, but being able to really apply what we've learned and really see it in action was just like just something amazing. So from setting up the actual payload on day of at like the cold flow test in Maine to using MATLAB and analyzing the data to see what it is that it tells us and what we can do using that data, it was just amazing. And overall, like the op this opportunity in general has prepared us for college and then whatever STEM field you wanna go into. So thank you so much for having us. And now I'm gonna hand over the the stage to Rena, who's going to talk more about like the data that we collected. My name is Rena. I'm the vice president of the Aerospace Club. Um, and so I just want to say, first of all, the experience of the cold flow test was absolutely amazing. So thank you for everyone to, for being able to put it together. Um, being able to actually see what goes into developing a rocket and an engine engine test was really cool um i've heard about like hot fire tests and i know like those are things that need to happen for uh engine testing but i never really understood the process and seeing the cold flow test really helped me understand that more and the all the time and effort that gets put into developing a rocket engine um in terms of like the data that we collected uh we as mentioned earlier we got vibration data and environmental data um, and we were able to use MATLAB to find the resonance frequency. And this is really important for us because as the people who are putting in the payload for the rocket, um, small vibrations can make pretty big impacts for the operation of the actual payload. Um, and so it was really, really interesting to see how the sensor that we use as a, on a day-to-day -day basis as part of the aerospace club could actually be used in a real life situation and for the actual development of the rocket engine. And so uh, one of my favorite parts was being able to take data that I've seen like just on a regular basis and actually apply it to a real life situation. And then from there actually analyze it. So going through each of the steps from development to actually putting it together and then analyzing the data was an amazing experience. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Eddie Tang who actually did more of the technical aspects for the data collection itself. Hi guys, um, I'm Eddie, a sophomore at the high school and a member of the club. And I'm the developer of the payload software scripts for both the vibrational and environmental data payloads. Uh, I spent a lot of time debugging the code and that, that went into both uh, the different types of payloads. And we had some major roadblocks that required out of the box thinking to fix. But by the end, we fixed all the issues and optimized the data collection rate that is possible with the ESP chips. And I also took into consideration uh, the power consumption and the positioning of the sensors. And altogether, um, it provided us as a team this, and this process of coding and 
debugging this these payloads, a, a great opportunity to work together and go uh, go over roadblocks and apply our coding skills to real world engineering. And it also allowed me to further understand the usage of MATLAB in coding in aerospace engineering uh, about the payloads. So in the future, uh, we would like to further optimize our code and make it easily reproducible on different chip sets that Max IQ produces. Um, again, if people are unfamiliar, and this is, I have my hands right here, uh, the Max IQ devices, and these are really cool modular devices, and the kids can choose from a, a multitude of sensors, and uh, and even like there's a module that has a little monitor on it, so you can actually see, you can actually look at what you're doing, you can control, and you can sort of semi-program the modules. Um, they're relatively easy to connect up to a, a laptop and program, and, you know, originally they were designed um, to do uh, way back when to do basic science for uh, students in uh, South Africa. And it's since been expanded to allow kids all over the world uh, to do space science. So we're, we're very excited. And you can see these are marvelously lightweight um, <clears throat> and very accessible to students. Uh, it's, it's really been incredibly impressive to see what they've done. Uh, for, for us, it was very invigorating to have all those students come by and um, and to be part of the the testing experience with us, uh, and I, I think what you also learned, and you just heard Eddie talking about this a second ago about what he would do next, right? And I think that's really about this iterative experience for for them as the students and sort of the ultimate end customer, and even for us as the launch provider, we're learning to adjust our services, learning to how to work better with students down the road, and uh, with uh, our direct customer Max IQ and the teachers. And um, it's really sort of an evolutionary experience that allows us to um, very organically grow our our launch services. And what's I think what's been exciting for us too, and I think Daniel and Cody, please interrupt me. Um, I think what's kind of exciting too is that we're able to, instead of waiting until we launch the rocket, for allow students to figure out, oh darn, that code work or didn't work or didn't, Gosh, it was harder than I thought to kind of strap this into the three U CubeSat enclosure in time. They were all able to get that experience now and start troubleshooting and error as opposed to going all the way to space and realize, darn, we forgot to turn it on, or darn, uh, we didn't format the SD card correctly. So I don't know if you guys want to speak to some of that as well. Yeah, well, you're totally right. So, and the great thing is too is that it's not only a learning experience for the students, but it's a learning experience for Max IQ too. So, we're a pretty new company here, and as we get ready to launch with you, um, we have to do our own testing. So, the three U enclosure, um, it was designed by a student from Princeton University for us. But at the same time, that was the first time that three U is actually in a real world environment, um, and that's really what we're trying to focus on, right? Because you made a great point. Things can go perfectly fine in the classroom, but it's not until you stick them into the real environment where there's multitude of forces acting on it that you know maybe things don't actually go right so and that's really the, the experiences that we're trying to give to our students here is the the real world learning that things don't always go right and it's really important to you know check your boxes dot your eyes and then when things don't go wrong uh, don't go right i'm sorry when they go wrong uh to you know kind of circle back and you know ask yourself what why did this happen so um huge thank you to blue shift obviously for providing this opportunity to our students um and something to note too you know blue shift you guys aren't just developing technology, you're developing the industry, right? You guys are helping to create that next generation that's going to be coming in and working on, you know, projects of this caliber. So really great work being done over there. So thank you so much. Yeah, just to piggyback off of what you said, Cody, real quick. Um, I think for me personally, as a teacher, right, like the iterative process, you know, it's something that we can say, right, in the classroom, right? We can, we can try to convince the kids all we want. Um, but until that iterative process leads to something, right, why is it that the kids should care? And I think that's kind of a big thing for me as a teacher is giving the students a reason to care about why they're doing what they're doing, right? It's not so much about what it is that, you know, we want them to be able to achieve just in that moment, but kind of what it, you said, Sasha, with this idea of, okay, so now what comes next, right? Yeah, we did this really cool thing, right? And we got that data, but now what? So how are we utilizing that information, right? The same way that we would in industry, right? And being able to create more parallels for the students to be able to see, right? This is what we do, right? In our everyday lives for what your parents might do in their own careers as well. 
right? How do we manipulate those pathways so that students have access to those things as well? And, and I think just like Cody said, right, being able to have access to the iterative process in something that is directly relating to real world data collection, right? You know, for someone like Eddie, when he's working through uh, the idea of efficiency in his scripts, right? Why does he need to be more efficient, right? Because the teacher told him so, or because there's an actual limitation in terms of how much bandwidth he can eat up collecting one sensor when he needs to collect data from maybe 10 sensors, right? So having those reasons, right? And having those reasons be very real reasons makes a huge difference in terms of not just student engagement, but why it is that students should care to begin with, and then what comes next. And I think that's actually a really great way to put it, Sasha, what comes next, I love that. Yeah, in fact, um, we just got a, a, a question here posted by Perry Ballard. Um, he's asking, he's saying, suggesting and asking the following question. You should keep track of the lessons learned at MaxIQ on the devices. Uh, what, what learned, what we learned, what you we've all learned. Um, and uh, do you have a library of software modules that people can download and share? I'm gonna just, uh, before Cody or Daniel, you guys kind of talk to that. I just wanna say what's kind of, one of the neat things that I've um, had the opportunity to go to uh, with the folks from MaxIQ to a couple of schools and um, here in Maine, and uh, got to see where the, the teachers are being trained on these modules and how they're used. And it's really neat to see, they have this really um, extensive training curriculum and the sort of online cloud-based um, uh, access to the training materials and lessons learned and a way for students to communicate with each other uh, and teachers to communicate back and forth and, and to share share all this information. It's really uh, it's really inspiring to see all of that that the Max IQ has developed. So, but uh, Cody or Daniel, if you guys don't mind talking about like this concept of sharing what's learned um, yes. and and also um, uh, you know what is the Apologize. Availability um, of the software. Yeah, no, totally. Yes, yes, um, thank you. So great suggestions. Um, I will say that after the conclusion of this program, we're definitely going to be having like a post-mortem with all the teams and everything where they can kind of outline their specific project. Because the thing is, too, is that while there might be some similarities between the sensor choices with our student teams, their project, uh, the mission goal or, or what they are investigating isn't necessarily the same thing. So, um, you know, we'll be having a, an opportunity for those students to be able to record all their data produce a report, if you will, um, and also, you know, the lessons learned, of course. Uh, speaking to the library of software, though, we are working on that. We have some uh, scripts that you could use with our kits on our GitHub page, and you can find that link on our website if you already have a MaxIQ kit. Uh, but we also have a Discord channel, which is a really collaborative space for different teams to be kind of sharing resources, um, you know, if they wrote their own uh, custom scripts. Uh, for instance, for this particular um, engine test, you know, we were able to share that script around, and that script actually had some features that our base software doesn't have. So, People have been taking that code and kind of, you know, taking out bits and parts of it and implementing it in their own unique code. So it's a really interesting process to see how things kind of dissipate through all the teams. Um, but yeah, I mean, over time, though, over the next couple of months, I think we're going to be getting a lot more organized with our website and everything. So, you know, um, probably getting all the resources into one solid place. So definitely something to keep your eye on. And I did send some links to all of our resources, our social pages, our website and all that a little bit up in the chat. And I'll do it again before we end off here. So. Right. We'll, we'll make sure to include some of those links as well, capture those links and put them in the, the YouTube recording too. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's so, okay. So we also get, had another question from uh, William Edmondson. Uh, uh, how are these student tests, how do the students tests basically inform uh, the redesign of our rocket? So, um, I, so we are just beginning to get the data uh, back from the students, and, and while we can't share the specifics due to some federal restrictions on the data itself, I think one of the interesting things that we were seeing was some uh, information about some resonances in our engine. Uh, one of the big challenges with engines is, um, well, if you, if you kind of compare it to an internal combustion engine, uh, you know, you deal with knocking. Well, they're serving as equivalent to that in the rocket world. And then there's a more, there's a peculiarity to hybrid rocket engines, which tend to be very long uh, cylinders where you can get big resonances build up that can be destructive. And I guess in some ways it could potentially be constructive, but in, in essence, you want to deal with frequencies below 300 Hertz and really, really reduce their amplitudes. Um, what was interesting was there was some, two frequencies that I saw from the data that made me, that gave me a big question of like, where and what the heck did that come from? Um, 
I don't think we saw that in our data. It was very low frequency, and so very curious to uh, kind of go that go through go through that with the engineering team and understand that. Um, it's hard to tell if that was um, potentially destructive, and our resonance will change um, as we change the. Actually, with this new engine, we're doing a new redesign of the engine, and it's uh, we are lengthening the engine. Uh, and we are changing our injector profile. And so as a result, um, uh, there will be, I'm sure that the resonances will absolutely change. And um, and I'm sure we'll see, we'll see some other artifacts of resonances. But yeah, when it comes to stability, uh, you wanna get those low frequency, low frequency resonances minimized as much as possible because it can kind of tear apart at the engine. Okay, um, <clears throat> I see another question here uh, from Perry. I remember years ago having to program in machine code. It's been a long time since I did machine code back in my electrical engineering days. He said, I had to program in machine code because the higher order languages were simply too slow for the state of art processors at the time. And I presume this is like state of art processors to collect the data and process and save the data. So I don't know, um, Cody or Daniel, if you wanna speak to that in terms of the uh, the processors and the code that has to be developed and the ability to collect the data in a timely fashion. You want me to take it, Cody, or? Take it away. Okay, you can take the next one. Um, so I would say, obviously, this statement there that Perry made most likely predates me as well. Uh, the big thing that I always tell my kids is, you know, between me and them, the age gap isn't too large. Um, but with that being said, um, there's not a lot of times where machine code was so much faster than the other languages that did exist for you know different kinds of programming. Um, nowadays, really, the big thing that we utilize um, at Max IQ. So now speaking with the content creator hat on for Max IQ, uh, we utilize Arduino, um, and the main goal there is for students to understand kind of hardware programming um, and kind of with more stripped down languages of C, C++, um, and getting them comfortable with this idea of, you know, what is it that's actually happening in the background, right? When we talk about executing a function, what's the goal, right? Why is it that sensors in particular allow us to be able to effectively accomplish that goal versus just running calculations and functions and, you know, programming something in Python um, uh, or Java instead. So the real goal here in terms of thinking about you know, what it is that we want students to achieve in that program is really kind of the holistic, you know, process. So rather than thinking about it in terms of quote unquote state of the art processors, right, or, you know, that we're collecting data at the same, you know, bandwidth or frequencies that a professional data collection company might be utilizing, you know, really more so the goal is that students are creating these things for themselves, by themselves, you know, from beginning to end. And just like Sasha mentioned, right, going through that reiterative process as well to, you know, make things better and better. So all of those things are really exciting. Um, I think where technology is now, it allows students in grades kindergarten to high school to be able to do that. You know, it's not, this is no longer, you know, kind of closed off just to that postdoc student in the electrical engineering department at a university. You know, students can go through that reiterative process and make that reiterative, reiterative process be really, really useful and really powerful. And, and they can learn so much from that. Um, so, you know, I think the technology allows for that to occur, but, you know, it's almost kind of like a, we, we slightly recreate the wheel, right? We know that the wheel exists, right? But we want students to go through the process of understanding, okay, well, how do we actually create it if we had to create it by ourselves, right? Not that we have to, and we have all of these different opportunities here and things like that. Thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> I mean, really part of the part of the elegance of the Max IQ solution is that, you know, you, the kids no longer have to worry about soldering, you know, how do you put things together? Darn, did you not solder the chip correctly? Did you burn the chip? Which I remember doing back in the day where you, well, that chip's fried. Um, it makes it very simple from a mechanical standpoint of assembly. And they, they focus more on like, what is the science I want to do? Uh, and the, and the, the training lessons make it easy as kids start learning the programming aspects. Um, and you can do experiments without essentially any pro, almost no, no programming no at all. Programming. You yeah. can just put them together. I remember I did some basic experiments when I was with the teachers uh, without having to even touch anything on a computer, which was cool, very cool and unexpected. Um, <clears throat> okay, we have another uh, great question here from Christian Hubs. 
Uh, he asks, what kind of timeline uh, would you like to target for the full process of students building, testing, and finally launching their payloads? And would this fit within the standard school semester or two? He's just wondering if this could be streamlined or standardized uh, over time. I, I know the answer to this question, but I'm gonna allow you, Cody, to answer, to answer yeah. it. So the, the whole goal of our program is to be completed within a single academic year. Um, so part of that does relate to the cadence of launch. So as Blue Shift develops their rocket further and their launch infrastructure further, um, that could probably increase. Um, but yeah, um, you know, I, I think this, like, like Sasha mentioned too, it's really about what your students want to get out of the kits, right? So uh, our kits come standardized. If you're going to use the vanilla Max IQ chipset and the vanilla uh, Max IQ firmware, you can be experimenting within 30 minutes and having your kits sending uh, data to your dashboard either uh, online or you could have an SD card storage. So, um, but for the students who are looking to take it a step further, we do have prototyping boards available. So you can integrate whatever, you know, circuit you wanted or if you had your own special sensor that you found off like Adaf Adafruit or something of the sort. Um, and for that, obviously that's gonna be up to the team who's gonna be completing those projects, their own specific timeline. But uh, to answer your question though, yes, uh, we are trying to keep the program contained within a single academic year. Exactly. And I think that's that's sort of the beauty of what we're doing at, at Blue Shift, since our goal is to be launching uh, six to 12 and ultimately 18 times a year suborbitally, uh, principally from uh, off the coast of Maine. Um, it really enables students to be launching all over the all over the course of the of the year uh, and uh, through summer as well. Um, fantastic time to be in Maine, by the way. Uh, I think we have a question here that maybe Eddie or one of the other students could um, could address. Perry has some follow-up questions regarding, you know, the sampling rate of data. Uh, he remembers back uh, when he had, you know, could really only get something like 20 samples per second, but he really needed 50 sa samples per second. Uh, so, you know, what, what sample rate um, do you guys, did you guys really need, he's asking, uh, to get insight into the data that you were sampling. Um, so, and he says, technology today is so fast, but sample rate relevance discussion is still really important. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the sample rate, maybe what the limitations for you were, and maybe what the, some of the, um, what it enabled you to do with, with the Max IQ processors. So I'll pass it over to it. I think Eddie might be a good one to yeah. answer, answer my question. So Eddie, Eddie, just let me know, he's kind of iffy about taking that one, um, especially just kind of with the uh, limitations in terms of the specifics that we can share. Um, obviously, we have two data collectors, right? So just so everyone is aware, right, we have the student payloads that are collecting data, but then, Sasha, hopefully you can confirm, right, you guys have your own companies, right, that, that also collect data on behalf of you guys. And, and have that. So there's a, the professional tier as well as the student tier. The reason why that's actually really, really great is because the students can actually be able to have a comparison then, right? We can be able to state whether or not the things that they are seeing are consistent with some of the things that they are seeing also on the professional level. So of course the resolution that, you know, professional companies that are collecting data can collect at are gonna be much, much, much higher. Um, you know, one of the things that Perry kind of brought up with this idea of looking at it in every 20, 20 times per second. Um, we're looking at it at a much higher rate than that now, just based on technology available. Um, I can't get into the specifics of it, obviously, but um, the rate at which that data is collected is high enough that students can perform a fast Fourier transform on it. So if that gives you a little bit of context, um, I don't know specifically how much how much more I can share about that. But in terms of the fast Fourier transform, it's the resolution is high enough that they can get a frequency and be able to measure those peak frequencies as well that they see in terms of the amplitudes as a whole. So. Yeah, I think we were getting uh, ultimately north of, of 100 Hertz or so. And that's, this is really, this is definitely within the realm of really valuable to us. Like I mentioned before, under 300 Hertz tends to be, or I guess you could say under 500 Hertz, but tends to be the areas of danger for an engine. Like if there's big resonance going on, that's where we could have some real issues. Um, so yeah, and our and for our data collection, we're 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 sampling at thousands of times per second for uh, a multitude of sensors, ranging from pressure sensors, load cells, uh, temperature sensors, et cetera. Um, and I think what some of the other neat things, and this is going to be really interesting when, um, as the students start analyzing the next set of data, is the hot fire test and understanding some of the gases that come out, 
Um, that in that case, you know, the sampling rate may be not quite as relevant. You don't have frequencies. Well, I guess you could. You never know uh, of of gases coming out. Um, but just getting generalized uh, data about what what sort of gases are being detected. I think that's going to be really interesting. Temperature, humidity. Um, <clears throat> I know the team was looking <laughs> looking at temperature and based upon where some of the sensors are, when we did the cold flow test, we're basically releasing, we're, we're injecting liquid CO2 into our system and injecting out as gas. Um, I, I would expect we'll see some temperature differences, if not some um, barometer changing distance, uh, differences too from that data set. I think that's going to be very exciting. And then, of course, when you do that on the hot fire test, now that's going to be extraordinary in terms of pressure. Um, and I got to I got to assume the barometer is going to shift. Uh, so there, there could be, and then of course the accelerometer data and the vibrational data is going to be extremely interesting to see. Um, so I'm really looking forward to when the students can can will be analyzing that data. And I know you get, the students have been very busy with other schoolwork. Um, so okay. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions from uh, from the attendees. Uh, this is great, great questions for uh, for all of us, for the students, for, for the teachers, and the Max IQ team. Uh, again, this is an incredible experience. Uh, it's been an incredible experience for us because it's really the cold flow test was the introductory experience to working with the end uh, customer for Blue Shift, which is the students. Uh, and I'll say. Maybe the end customer, but maybe the future employee. You never know. Um, certainly, what we're hoping for. Um, uh, and if nothing else, folks who are going to be kids that are uh, otherwise might not think that science and a STEM field is accessible to them, uh, knowing that they can't participate in this. I'm very excited not only for the students that we had during the cold flow test and uh, their experiments as they did in the hot fire test, but here in the state of Maine. I'm really excited about this uh, federally funded program for a pilot 15 schools here in the state to participate in doing this space science uh, with these same modules and, and many of them will be launching with us in our main flight to space. So all of this is thanks to uh, folks like you uh, here uh, in this call and hopefully folks who will be investing in Blue Shift. We are again almost 10 days away from wrapping up our very last uh, equity crowdfunding campaign on, on WeFunder. So if you go to wefunder.com slash blue shift, that's blue without a knee, uh, you can find out about our campaign. This is the last opportunity. This is sort of the last opportunity for a sort of a democratized access to invest in what our vision for the future, not only doing things in a cleaner, more earth-friendly way, but doing things that really excite uh, our youth and our, not only in, in our home state of Maine and our country, the United States, but the world, and making it very accessible uh, for students to be part of our scientific future and involving uh, our our planet and who and humanity in a way that's meaningful. Um, so, check check out wefunder.com. Check out Blue Shift. Last couple of days are left, and I want to say a big thanks to the students who came on board. I know, uh, thanks to Eddie, Rena. Um, and uh, Suhani for joining us today. A big thanks to Daniel Lee and Cody Harris from Max IQ. And, um, and I really appreciate your guys' <clears throat> insights and sharing your experiences uh, with, with all the folks on board, our investors and beyond. Um, so thank you guys very much. And <clears throat> that is a cut. Uh, thank you guys. And check out WeFunder.com. Uh, last few days here to consider investing in Blue Ship. Thank you all very much for making this possible. Have a good day.